Hi, I'm Mark Ransfield. I'm a senior research fellow in the computing department at Lancaster University. Uh, Peter told me he's my imaginary friend. <laughs> and it's quite important where I come from, which is from a computing department, because computer scientists love ethnography and ethnomethodology. And the reason that I'm there is because before you design a system for a setting, you need to understand something about how work goes on in that setting, what people do. And the kind of people they send out to find out about that are people like me, largely because I'm cheap, compared with a computer scientist. And computer scientists like the kind of stuff that we do, like Dave and Eric presented because they don't need to understand post-modernism, post-Marxism or post-feminism in order to understand what you tell them. They can quite easily read the descriptions you give of what goes on there and see the implications of this for the systems that they design. Now, in this particular talk, Ethnomethodology at Play, there's a kind of history to it, which is, this is a book that's coming out in May, available in all good booksellers for around about 50 quid. But its origins was a book that we produced last year, also available in booksellers, called Ethnomethodology at Work. And that book was an attempt to describe for students some of the skills and ideas that they might think about as they go about the business of designing systems for workplace settings. What kind of things might they want to notice about what goes on in there? And after we finished this, and as we started thinking about the kind of work that we were doing now, what we noticed was that actually the kind of work we were doing was very different. When we first started, I was doing works in bank, works in banks, in uh, steelworks, in hotels, and so on. And it was about designing big systems for these kind of organisations. But when you look at computing now, you'll see that computing is kind of ubiquitous and embedded. You know, you've got them in your shoes, if you've got Nike shoes and those little devices. People are using computers to uh, play games, communicate with each other and so on. It's, it's less of this kind of focus on big systems for kind of real work, really. And so this is about trying to look at the kinds of things that we might want to design systems for now and in the future. And it's kind of playful things. So what I wanted to do was to, I'll start off with a rant about sociology and how useless it is, and then I'll go into a couple of examples of how ethnomethodology treats what we might loosely call play. And in this, what I want to do is kind of pose a contrast, I suppose, with what is, what is typically, typically seen as um, an ethnomethodological approach, which is to look at work and look at fairly trivial activities, if you like. So we're going to look at a mother reading a story to a daughter, and we're going to look at a bloke making a tart tatam. Uh, and in that, we're going to emphasise small parts of it. Obviously, I can't present at all. So, most ethnomethodologists start off their presentations by apologising for all sorts of things. But I can't be bothered to apologise today. <laughs> so, we're looking at play. Play is an ordinary word. And we use play as a kind of ordering device to look at a range of things that aren't monetarily rewarded necessarily. Um, and it's intended to show the kind of depth of ethnomethodological analysis, which has often been linked purely to studies of work, now, when we talk about play, we, kinda, we use it as a kind of ironic contrast with work, work and play. But, of course, for ethnomethodologists, play involves work. We work at the things that we do. All activities, even work, in, sorry, even play involves some kind of work. For the ethnomethodologist, there's no domain of human practice that is exempt from this Human action and interaction doesn't just tumble from the sky ready formed. Instead, even the most mundane of actions, reading stories to your kids, making pies and so on, have to be produced somehow, somewhere, somewhere, and this is a job of work. Now, 
Sociology has, has had kind of a kind of tradition of looking at play from about the 70s when they looked at the contrast between work and play. It was kind of a residual category in some ways. They looked at what people did in their work and then there was kind of play which was seen as an opposition in some way to it. Now for me, what sociology is supposed to be about is to discover what's social about the social world. But what sociology does when it looks at play is it uses it in the way that it uses everything everything it studies. It uses this particular topic for rehearsal of arguments about theory, about why the world happens to be the way it is, who's got the best theory and so on. And what we find is, as in the sociological studies of work, we learn very little about activities that we might normally think of as playful, as leisure, just as we learn very little about what it might be to work in a bank, when you look at standard sociological accounts of these activities. And what happens in this is that this kind of description of what people actually do when they play is sacrificed. If sacrifice is the right word for not doing something you're not really very interested in, in exchange for doing some kind of disciplinary or political or theoretical kind of um, enterprise. And what happens is the analysis of sport and play and leisure becomes this docile matrix for the exercise of theoretical will, to steal something that Rod Watson said once. And here's an example. Now I'm not saying this is, is bad stuff, this is good work. But I think we should read it. So this is about serious, le there's, there's a, a movement about leisure called serious leisure movement as opposed to the unserious leisure movement, I suppose. Serious leisure identities and aligning actions among skydivers and gun collectors is the name of this paper. One of the most enduring expressions within the skydiving argo is the maxim, eat, fuck, skydive. By designating skydiving as belonging to the same basic category as eating and intercourse, the expression undergoes the sensual, hedonistic character of the experience and implies that people skydive for the same reasons that they engage in the other two activities. Intertwined with the foregoing themes in skydiving subculture is an ethos of hyper-heterosexuality and male dominance. While skydiving culture has been changing in recent years in ways that may be reducing this patriarchal hegemony, the change is variable across the skydiving community, where hyper-heterosexuality and male dominance continue to be strong, if not as hegemonic as in the past. There we go. A wonderful piece of work. But you learn nothing about skydiving from it. Or I challenge you to find anything about skydiving. You know, they throw you out of the plane, you're reading that. You're not going to do very well. Oh, well, here's another one. What do you think this is? a complex material interaction between the material capital that is in the objects of the kits and the embodied capital that is in the body of the sailor. Well, it's a bit of a giveaway, but it's not about say It's about windsurfing. Now again, all I'm saying is, how would you guess? How would you know? What does it tell you that's at all useful in trying to understand what it means to be a windsurfer? And what we get here is a kind of standard theme in sociology which is hiding the phenomena. And you hide it behind an analysis of other things. In the first case, hyper-heterosexuality, and in this case, the notion of capital of various kinds. And so what sociology does is it presumes that all its problems are theoretical. Whereas for me, of course, the problem is that what they do is they make the phenomena we're interested in simply disappear. So, I want to look at play from a kind of ethno point of view, and I'm not the first. Lots of people have done this before, or at least lots of methodologists have done this. And here are a few examples. Garfinkel's got a very nice um, piece of work, um, which is about assembling flat pack furniture. Again, I mean, it's a standard kind of leisure pursuit. You drop down to IKEA. Not many people have studied what, that, what you do there. And if you read Garfinkel's account of this, uh, you know, assembling flat pack furniture, you can see the problems of people that go to Ikea. When he lets out this whale, do I have all the parts? He's trying to follow instructions. 
and is wondering as he got all the parts. Similarly, there are other accounts of what we might think of as leisure or playful activities, sudden studies of uh, learning jazz piano, weird though he was, Livingston stuff on checkers and jigsaw puzzles. Again, these are all nicely detailed accounts of what people do when they do these activities. I've always really liked this study here by um, Good, called Playing With My Dog Katie, an ethnomethodological study of dog-human interaction. Again, I apologise for the long quote, but it, it tells you what he's trying to do. This book's an attempt to display in detail a guardian playing with his dog, an instance of just that. That people play with dogs in itself, in its own right, a miracle of everyday society. I'm not saying that play between companion dogs and their guardians is socially or politically important or consequential. It's more like when Sachs watched and analysed the videotape of a couple greeting each other at the door. He was not doing so to advance a political agenda, to change how people greet each other at doors, for example. He did it to discover and appreciate the incredible details in and of the simplest things we do. And it's that last phrase there, to discover and appreciate the incredible details in and of the simplest things we do, which is what I'm interested in doing. So what we're looking at is uh, bedtime stories. Um, again, I came into this by accident. I was doing some work for Microsoft, vaguely, about um, Kindles. Um, because that kind of agenda about how people are going to be reading in the future was driven by a lot of kind of old bollocks is the phrase I'm searching for. So reading is a fairly commonplace activity. We can see it in all kinds of human settings. Um, the early sociological uh, accounts of reading generally focused on the kind of usual suspects of class differences in reading, gender differences in reading, and what affected what and how people read. But more recently, as I said, you get this whole kind of technological change, and people have become interested in what things people are going to read on. I mean, obviously, there's a kind of economic argument going on here. And you can see you know, some of the sorts of things in what's happening in the high street. But the argument is firstly about what, what are people going to be reading on? And secondly, what kind of impact does it have? Um, whereas what I was interested in was a simple one, which is, well, how do people actually go about doing reading? And we chose bedtime reading as an easily accessible example. So what we've got here is a, a, a short uh, piece of video. It's a much longer piece. I've chopped it down quite a lot. That looks at the practice of reading stories to children. Again, it's familiar to you all. I imagine you've seen your mother, father, somebody read to a child. You may have done it yourself. And we're interested in how reading gets accomplished, how it fits into the activities of the household, who does it, where and when, how do we recognise it, how is it visibly done, and what is the impact of this on other features of household organisation, and how it, this in turn shows you know, an aspect of leisure, play, playfulness, um, enjoyment. And in some ways too, it, this what, is what comes out of this too. I mean, often people say that ethnomethodology can't deal with the senses, because yeah, it's all about work. And what I'm trying to show with this is, well, actually, can. all you have to do is have a look at it, and you'll see it, because we can see these things in everyday life. So we start off with this um, video. What we've got? Oh, can you see that? It's all. I guess I've got a great picture. Um, this is a, a mummy reading to her daughter. Taking a rock, each Three. 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 Three.
All right, I think we'll miss that bit. Um, basically, what you've got there is there's a mummy and her daughter. Uh, it's uh, time for a story before she goes to bed. They're snuggled up on the sofa, and the mummy has got the book in one hand. It's um, the Golden Compass. And Sarah, the little girl, is... I we haven't got a sofa here, but she's just here, and her mother is touching her arm, stroking her, and it finishes off with a, a kind of argument about um, how much more of the book she should be reading and so on. So the first, and so what I want to do is how, how can we go about analysing the kind of data that we've collected here, which, believe me, honestly, is not as dark as it was there. It's, it's, it's perfect on here. So the first thing that you notice about this is the kind of embodied nature of reading. Right? That uh, the opening of the book, the flicking through of the pages, the lifting out of the bookmark, putting the bookmark on the arm of the chair, positioning the book to read so that they can both, sit, both see it, asking her daughter Sarah, no, it's, well, we'll call her Sarah, but it's not Sarah actually, uh, to recall what happened, flicking through the book to find where she was last, and then what happens later is that there's a sort of negotiation. She flicks through with one hand to see where she's going to finish this time. Okay, so this, these are ways in which it's embodied. How the mother sits and the daughter sits with her. How they hold each other in various ways. How they hold hands. The angle of the head, how it's oriented towards the book and so on. What they're looking at, the direction of the gaze, because again... If they're not looking at the book, you can see that this is an accountable kind of behaviour. If the mother sees that here she's reading and her daughter's looking elsewhere, maybe she's thinking, well, well I ain't going to read to you, mate. Or at least that's what I would think. Okay, so each of these accomplishes this notion of reading to the daughter or being read to by mummy. And you can see, as I said, the position of the, the, the head, the looking at the book, um, Anything else where they look away, it becomes a kind of accountable practice. Either the child is not enjoying the book, for example, or she's too tired, or she's restless, or whatever. And this isn't just any old reading. This is Marks and Spencer's reading. Sorry. This is bedtime reading. The child's ready for bed, it's physically tired, it's in his gym jams, and the mother is alert to these kinds of signs. And here we see, in a rather better detail, we've got a whole series of these, watching as she uses her fingers to flick through the various pages. So she's marking where she is with her finger in here. She's flicking through to see whereabouts she might end this particular kind of reading. So what she's doing is a kind of manifest kind of behaviour. Everybody else can see what's going on. That is... The other people in the household can see mummy is reading to Sarah. Right? And people can reason about this. They can say things like, well, she's re you know, if she's reading to Sarah now, I have some idea about how long that's going to go on. Because normally it lasts about 20 minutes. So if I want to ask mum a question, can you give me some money to go down to the pub, I'm going to have to wait 20 minutes and so on. Right? So... This act of reading is available to everybody in the setting. It has implications for how others might orient to mummy, the reader. They can see at a glance that she's reading to Sarah. And it impacts on whether they can interrupt, whether they can listen, whether they can do anything else in the household, which of course they can't, because this is reading time. And it's manifest in the sense that it's audible. They can hear her reading to Sarah. And being a kind of competent member means knowing what exactly this means. That this is part of an everyday activity, which is mummy reading to Sarah right now. And if it was something else going on, if there was still reading going on, but it was Sarah reading, they could account for that in a rather different way, which is, this is Sarah practising, in this case it would be a French, because this is a French family. Or if the mother is reading to her daughter in French, again, you, they would count this as this is doing homework. Okay, so in hearing, they're hearing what's going on and they're making some kind of um, judgments about what exactly this means. 
Meanwhile, it has a visible order. It has a beginning. It's got a middle in which the books are engaged with. And there's the end when the books are closed. Bookmarks are inserted if they've not finished that book. And the book gets put away until tomorrow. And so it has kind of these various kind of spatio-temporal characteristics. It's done at a particular time. And it's done in a particular kind of setting. It wouldn't be normal to do it in other settings. They've chosen somewhere that's nice and comfy. They're wearing comfy clothes and so on. And it enables the rest of the household to see unproblematically what exactly is going on. And what we also see as part of this reading is how some aspects of social relations within the household get accomplished. Okay, and I, I won't read through all of this, but what you can see here is so the mother's sitting down, she puts her arm around Sarah, she straightens out the book to read, she puts a hand on Sarah's head, <coughs> she farts, so she says, pardon me, sorry, we, we didn't put the fart in there. Um, and she starts to read, she puts her arm around Sarah, she, uh, Sarah puts her hand on her mother's, a mother strokes her head. So, I mean, obviously there's reading going on. I've kind of simplified this. But what I'm trying to show you is, here we see various aspects of everyday family intimacy going on. You can see that, that um, um, we, what's happening here, you know, anybody can see it at a glance. And also it provides the kind of opportunity, it's a kind of mechanism, if you like, whereby these sorts of opportunities get provided. You know, obviously children can ask for cuddles at any time, but this is an occasion when it's normal to do so, because they cuddle up in order to read the book. So that's reading, um, and I wanted to go through this next example fairly quickly, I think, um, which is to look at cooking. Again, um, I'm just picking a few examples out from here, and, and basically what we did is we videoed somebody cooking a three-course meal. <coughs> um, and I was particularly interested in the tart tatam bit, but there was also a pumpkin soup and a chicken curry. Um, but again, if we start off with the usual rant, which is that cooking is a mundane feature of everyday life, we all do it, it's, it's necessary, <coughs> because otherwise we'll die, and for some people, at least, it's the business of pleasure. And you know, it doesn't take that much to realise that there's a kind of pleasure in it. We, some of us watch the great British Bake Off. And we can see, and some of us don't, of course, because some of us know how to cook already. Um, some of us don't even bother cooking. But we still like these kind of things. And until relatively recently, I think, kind of mundane aspects of everyday life, that is cooking and eating, have, have kind of been neglected by sociology. There was some element of, in Elias's work um, in the civilising process where he looked at the, um, the use of knife and forks and napkins and so on. And more recently, of course, it's been seen in terms of patriarchy and the subjection of women. But again, all we're interested in is m missing out these big theoretical arguments and say, you know, what happens? What's going on here? How do people make food? What kind of things can we see and how can we analyse it? So what we see is there's a whole series of kind of mundane competencies going on in which um, people, first of all, figure out what they want to eat. They might then draw up a list. They might then go and do the shopping. They then bring the shopping home. They then assemble their utensils and their bits of uh, food. They do various forms of chopping and mixing, <coughs> followed up with all kinds of tasting and sensing and so on, and they finish off with eating. Okay, so when they start to figure out what to eat, when they start going shopping, they're thinking about all kinds of things, about, um, you know, what kind of time are we going to eat? Who eats what sort of thing in, in our house? Um, in my house, for example, I have a daughter who's a vegetarian who doesn't eat vegetables. So shopping is difficult, as is cooking. And there's all sorts of other arguments about, you know, how much time do you want to spend doing this? Is it, you know, are we so knackered we just want to get a takeaway? 
We then go and do the shopping, and again, there are differences here that we can see. Um, so these differences can become quite important. We'll talk about that later. So, for example, in my household, generally speaking, I do the shopping. But my wife draws up the list. And she draws up the list knowing the order that things appear in Sainsbury's. And when Sainsbury's change their order, there's hell to pay. Because I'm going down what is supposed to be the vegetable aisle and it's turned into meat. Okay? So there, there are all kinds of um, working knowledge in the finding of food and the assembling of ingredients. And then lastly, there's this process of cooking, of using heat, pans, spices, herbs and so on. And then thinking about stuff like colour, texture, taste, smell, sound, in order to get something that you rather like. So here are some examples taken from this long-ish <coughs> video. Um, and this is the making of a list. And I've, I put this in because I'm going to refer to it. So here, the guy who's going to do all the cooking, um, he's already got a list of things that he needs. He's very organised and he has a list on the board. As he goes through the week, he writes on things that he needs to get when he next goes shopping. So th he says, that's what I've already got on there this week. He then goes to the chopping board and looks at the list and starts thinking about what he's going to cook today. Now, for me, <coughs> and we've already had a discussion about why we're not going to have marrow, because I hate marrow. All right, so he writes down the things that we're going to have. So there's some chicken, there's some puff pastry. He's going to do a tart satin, so he needs pastry. He wants sugar. And you can see him constructing the list so that he can go out and buy it. Now, originally he was going to go up to his allotment and get some onions, but he's decided it's so horrible outside that he's just going to go and buy some. So here's the list, and it finishes it off. Yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? And then we go off to the shops and we buy stuff, and then we come back and we start making things. And here, these are various pictures of making a tart tatan. It's a pear tart tatan. Ah, I like to think of it as a Liebenswelt pear tatan. Um, <laughs> I know. So, I mean, the, the thing that I was quite interested in here, this is a very relatively short piece of um, action, if you like. But what I find quite interesting is the en engagement of the senses and how we can describe the things that people do when they are using their senses. So in this first one, he's doing a lot of sniffing. You know, there he is, sticking his nose in the pan that's got the, the pears in. He sniffs at the pan on the hob and then says to Peter, get your nose in that. And then I have to have a sniff and I make the amazing suggestion, you can smell the sugar, can't you? And just starting to smell the fruit, he's got no, he has another sniff. Can you smell the pear in there? It's coming through now. And then I start talking about. I, I'm embarrassed about the kind of things I say in these circumstances. But you know, here he is talking about the things that he can smell. The sweetness is there, and then the fruit's just percolating through it. It becomes stronger. And he talks about how, when because he's the cook in the household, is often when his wife comes in. She says, that smells good. So there's smell. This is sight. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same pose, except now he's not sniffing. He's just looking at the wretched things there, whereby he's looking to see if they're brown enough, basically. He's trying to see... Uh, no, I'm, not, I'm not a cook of tart tatan, and it's something to do with the kind of caramelising of the, the sugar. <coughs> So he says, basically what you're doing there is uh, it gets cooked for about 45 minutes. You're just making a caramel sauce. You're doing fruit in a caramel sauce with a lump of pastry on top. It ain't complicated. So he looks at the stuff there. He sniffs. He shakes the pan. He again looks at the pears because he's trying to see if they're getting enough colour. And in this one, he's listening to the pan. Again... I mean, there are all sorts of things going on here. So he, he's stirring it with a spoon and he's saying, can you hear that? It's going too fast. You can tell how things are cooking by the sound that's coming from the pan. So what we see in these examples 
are a guy using his senses and we're describing the senses that he uses in order to cook a tart tata. And so what must occur to you is the usual question, so what? Um, and I used to worry about this question, but I don't do so much now because being in a computing department, the answer is often fairly obvious. We're doing these things in order to inform design. This is what's called the classic implications for design question. So in the case of um, the mother reading the story to a child, now obviously the children's book market is enormous. And so lots of technology companies have designed all sorts of things which they want to take the place of traditional books. And so you can get things which open up and on this side you've got Elmo reading you a story and on this side you've got your granny who might read it too. You've got some kind of Skype connection. There's no end of things. And I'm not saying that's not, not a good thing, although personally I don't think it is. But what I'm saying is what comes out of the study of this you know, woman reading to her daughter. It's all the kinds of things that are surrounding reading a story to your daughter, the touching, you know, that it's, it's kind of place in the social order of the home and so on. The ability to see where you are, the kind of haptic qualities of a book. And again, I'm not saying that books are fantastic, although I think they are, but just that these are the kinds of things you need to bear in mind when you start to do design work. That is, if the book has these kinds of affordances, how are you going to stick these in some other device? Similarly, uh, with the cooking and the shopping and stuff, for us, the important thing about that comes out of that kind of study is this idea of understanding users. <coughs> and we've actually moved on from some of these studies, and this was a study we did of, of shopping lists. And again, I'm afraid you can't see it very well, but <coughs> the kind of thing that does come out of looking at shopping lists is... Um, Here's the list. The husband and wife have written on this. So you get different, um, different handwriting from the husband and wife. And just here, where it says chocolate biscuits, the kid has started writing on, on the list. Right? And so it's quite interesting about the idea of the shopping list as a, a way in which people communicate the kinds of things that they want, and then who controls it. Because it's quite easy to move this kind of thing onto here, onto your mobile phone. And that's one of the, the applications we've developed whereby people can go around to supermarkets and in this case they're buying stuff but the, the idea is that they can press these buttons it will tell them about its impact on their carbon footprint. But you can do things for diet and so on. And so overall <coughs> this is the thing that I think is interesting. One from the viewpoint of design which is Casey in a book called Set Phases on Stun and other true tales of design. Uh, new technologies will succeed or fail based on our ability to minimise the incompatibilities between the characteristics of people <coughs> and the characteristics of the things we create and use. Now that is the point of some of the stuff we do. And the other quote that I particularly like is this one here, which is from Harley Sachs. Uh, this is actually about the, f the telephone. But it seems to me it's kind of applicable to lots of kind of technical interventions in the world. Where we assume that the provision of this particular device, you know, the iPhone or whatever, will bring about a transformation in social relations. When what happens is that this device is placed in a world that is already organised. It's not that it's going to create the world anew. But what happens is the object's made at home in the world that has whatever organisation it already has. Thank you.